Hi, I'm Rashonda Cade. This is Reading with Rashonda. We are reading Running a Thousand Miles for Freedom by William and Ellen Craft. And um, there really aren't chapters in here, so normally I would be like, we're starting chapter two. But there isn't a chapter two. So we are starting video two. And let's begin. The Reverend George Byrne of Virginia, in his picture of slavery published in 1834, relates the case of a white boy who, at the age of seven, was stolen from his home in Ohio, tanned and stained in such a way that he could not be distinguished from a person of color, and then sold as a slave in Virginia. I'm sorry, he was tanned and stained? That seems kind of extreme. I'll keep reading, though. Um, at the age of 20, he made his escape by running away and happily succeeded in rejoining his parents. I have known worthless white people to sell their own free children into slavery, and as there are good-for-nothing white as well as colored persons everywhere, no one perhaps will wonder at such inhuman transactions, particularly in the southern states of America, where I believe there is a greater want of humanity and high principle amongst the whites than among any other civilized people in the world. Ouch! <laughs> Ouch! Okay, so first, they say that, um, I have known worthless white people, and then he talks about good-for-nothing white as well as colored persons everywhere, so you're like, whew, okay, everybody has their worthless people. Um, but then he says, in the southern states of America, there is a greater want of humanity and high principle amongst the whites than among any other civilized people in the world. Wow. He said, but southern whites during this time period, they say, have a greater want of humanity and high principle than anybody else in the civilized world. Wow. That is a cold statement. I'm not saying that William and Ellen Craft don't believe it. Whew. I'm just saying it's harsh. All right, I'll keep reading. I know that those who are not familiar with the working of the peculiar institution can scarcely imagine anyone so totally devoid of all natural affection as to sell his own offspring into returnless bondage. But Shakespeare, that great observer of human nature, says, with caution judge of probabilities, things deemed unlikely, e'en impossible, experience often shews us to be true. That's deep. With caution judge of probabilities, things deemed unlikely and even impossible, experience shows us to be true. Wow, so when you think something is impossible, experience says, hmm, it wasn't as impossible as you thought it might be. I know I've been off track since we started, but just thinking about the coronavirus pandemic, I, I, I never imagined that I would be living in a time where toilet paper was scarce and people were walking around wearing masks. It would have seemed impossible to me, um, you know, six months ago, let alone many years ago. But experience has shown me that what seems impossible is often true. And that's really just to say, at least for present day, um, circumstances can make people do all kinds of things. And I don't just mean dire circumstances. If something is right in the society, people will do things because it's societally correct. So anyway, I will keep reading. My wife's new mistress was decidedly more humane than the majority of her class. My wife has always given her credit for not exposing her to many of the worst features of slavery. For instance, it is a common practice in the slave states for ladies, when angry with their maids, to send them to the Calibus Sugar House or to some other established or to some other place established for the purpose of punishing slaves and have them severely flogged. And I am sorry it is a fact that the villains to whom these defenseless creatures are sent not only flog them as they are ordered, but frequently compel them to submit to the greatest indignity. Uh, 
Oh, if there is any one thing under the wide canopy of heaven horrible enough to stir a man's soul and to make his very blood boil, it is the thought of his dear wife, his unprotected sister, or his young and virtuous daughters struggling to save themselves from falling a prey to such demons. It always appears strange to me that anyone who was not born a slaveholder and steeped to the very core in the demoralizing atmosphere of the southern states can any way palliate slavery. It is still more surprising to see virtuous ladies looking with patience upon and remaining indifferent to the existence of a system that exposes nearly two millions of their own sex in the manner I have mentioned, and that too in a professedly free and Christian country. There is, however, great consolation in knowing that God is just and will not let the oppressor or the weak and the spoiler of the virtuous escape unpunished here and hereafter. So something that occurs to me, so clearly they're talking about um, slave women who were sent to these establishments to be punished or often raped as well. And um, this excoriating tribute to um, Southern womanhood is really interesting. Um, they write, it is still more surprising to see virtuous ladies looking with patience upon and remaining indifferent to the existence of a system that exposes nearly two millions of their own sex in the manner I have mentioned. So he calls these women virtuous ladies. Um, Virtue could mean a lot of things. It could mean they're Christians. It could mean they're good wives and mothers. I think in this instance, though, it probably means that their virtue, their sexual virtue is intact. If they are unmarried, they are virgins. Um, if they are married, they're not. And that they haven't been raped. Um, and so he's saying, they are saying, how can these women look at other women and say, yeah, it's okay for them to be raped. And I, and I wonder, I mean, there's a lot going on, but I wonder, are the white women who send the slave women off to get punished and possibly, maybe probably raped thinking it's not happening to me. The men are going to rape someone. Let me give them somebody who's not me for them to rape. I don't know what was in their minds, but that struck me. Um, I will continue reading. I believe a similar retribution to that which destroyed Sodom is hanging over the slaveholders. My sincere prayer is that they may not provoke God by persisting in a reckless course of wickedness to pour out his consuming wrath upon them. I must now return to our history. My old master had the reputation of being a very humane and Christian man, but he thought nothing of selling my poor old father and dear aged mother at separate times to different persons to be dragged off never to behold each other again till summoned to appear before the great tribunal of heaven. But oh, what a happy meeting it will be on that day for those faithful souls. I say a happy meeting because I never saw persons more devoted to the service of God than they. But how will the case stand with those reckless traffickers in human flesh and blood who plunged the poisonous dagger of separation into those loving hearts which God had for so many years closely joined together, nay, sealed as it were with his own hands for the eternal courts of heaven? It is not for me to say what will become of those heartless tyrants. I must leave them in the hands of an all-wise and just God who will, in his own good time, and in his own way, avenge the wrongs of his oppressed people. My old master also sold a dear brother and a sister in the same manner as he did my father and mother. The reason he assigned for disposing of my parents, as well as of several other age slaves, was that they were getting too old and would soon become valueless in the market, and therefore he intended to sell off all the old stock and buy in a young lot. Ouch! A most disgraceful conclusion for a man to come to who made such great professions of religion. This shameful conduct gave me a thorough hatred not for true Christianity, but for slave-holding piety. My old master then, wishing to make the most of the rest of his slaves, apprenticed a brother and myself out to learn trades. 
he to a blacksmith, and myself to a cabinet maker. If a slave has a good trade, he will let or sell for more than a person without one, and many slaveholders have their slaves taught trades on this account. But before our time expired, my old master wanted money, so he sold my brother and then mortgaged my sister, a dear girl about 14 years of age, and myself, then about 16, to one of the banks to get money to speculate in cotton. This we knew nothing of at the moment, but time rolled on, the money became due, my master was unable to meet his payments, so the bank had us placed upon the auction stand and sold to the highest bidder. My poor sister was sold first. She was knocked down to a planter who resided at some distance in the country. Then I was called upon the stand. While the auctioneer was crying the bids, I saw the man that had purchased my sister getting her into a cart to take her to his home. I had once asked a slave friend who was standing near the platform to run and ask the gentleman if he would please to wait till I was sold in order that I might have an opportunity of bidding her goodbye. He sent me word back that he had some distance to go and could not wait. I then turned to the auctioneer, fell upon my knees, and humbly prayed him to let me just step down and bid my last sister farewell. But instead of granting me this request, he grasped me by the neck and in a commanding tone of voice and with a violent oath exclaimed, Get up! You can do the wench no good, therefore there is no use in your seeing her. Mm. On rising, I saw the cart in which she sat moving slowly off, and as she clasped her hands with a grasp that indicated despair and looked pitifully round towards me, I also saw the large silent tears trickling down her cheeks. She made a farewell bow and buried her face in her lap. This seemed more than I could bear. It appeared to swell my aching heart to its utmost, but before I could fairly recover, the poor girl was gone, gone, and I have never had the good fortune to see her from that day to this. Perhaps I should have never heard of her again had it not been for the untiring efforts of my good old mother, who became free a few years ago by purchase, and after a great deal of difficulty, found my sister residing with a family in Mississippi. My mother at once wrote to me, informing me of the fact and requesting me to do something to get her free, and I am happy to say that, partly by lecturing occasionally, and through the sale of an engraving of my wife in the disguise in which she escaped, together with the extreme kindness and generosity of Miss Burdett Coutts, Mr. George Richardson of Plymouth, and a few other friends, I have nearly accomplished this. It would be to me a great and ever-glorious achievement to restore my sister to our dear mother, from whom she was forcibly driven early in life. So I'm just going to stop here. So he's saying he paid for some of this partly by lecturing occasionally. Now, if you were with me when we read Our Nig, you'll remember that um, Fredo's husband went out on the lecture circuit. He was not actually an escaped slave. He was lying about that. But he did go on the lecture circuit to tell his story and to help rouse up abolitionists. Um, and it's a way to make money. So that's what William and Ellen Crafts did. William and Ellen Craft did. Um, they went on the lecture circuit and told about their story of slavery and their escape from slavery. So that was just an interesting um, thing. And William Wells Brown, who wrote Clotel, did the same thing. Um, Frederick Douglass, I think Ludo Equiano, he might not have, I think he did. It was a thing that people did um, to help everyone see the cause, to see what slavery really was, and it was a way to make some money. All right, I'll keep reading. I was knocked down to the cashier of the bank to which we were mortgaged, mor mortgaged in order to return to the cabinet shop where I previously worked. But the thought of the harsh auctioneer not allowing me to bid my dear sister farewell, farewell sent red-hot indignation darting like lightning through every vein. It quenched my tears and appeared to set my brain on fire and made me crave for power to avenge our wrongs. <sighs> But alas, we were only slaves and had no legal rights. Consequently, we were compelled to smother our wounded feelings and crouch beneath the iron heel of despotism. 
I must now give the account of our escape, but before doing so it may be well to quote a few passages from the fundamental laws of slavery in order to give some idea of the legal as well as the social tyranny from which we fled. I'm just, okay, that's a whole lot of laws. I'm going to stop here. So we'll start next time with, how did he say it? Um, he will quote a few passages from the fundamental laws of slavery in order to give some idea of the legal as well as the social tyranny from which we fled. So we'll start there looking at the fundamental laws of slavery. And I'm just marking my spot in my book. Boom, it's marked. Okay, so we are reading Running a Thousand Miles for Freedom by William and Ellen Craft. I'm Rashonda Cade, and this is Reading with Rashonda.